Good morning, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Um, so welcome to today's webinar, Management of Memorials in Your Cemetery. But yeah, so over the next 60 minutes, uh, Julie is going to give you a whistle-stop tour of how to manage uh, memorials. She said it's going to be quite difficult to squeeze it all in. Then I'm going to give a, uh, well, actually going to play a video of uh, my colleague uh, Nathan giving an overview of our cemetery product. That'll be four and a half minutes, and then we'll be jumping into Q&A. Does that sound good for everybody? Good, thumbs up. Um, so uh, while that po poll is running, so I'm not uh, sure you're all familiar with Julie. Um, Julie is the chief exec of the Institute of Cemetery and Crematorium Management. She also does a lot of work in a local community. She's actually the bookings clerk um, for Stale Paying Parish Council. Yeah. I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank Fire you. away. Cheers, John, thanks for that. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for joining and for giving up your precious time. I know how busy uh, you all must be at the moment. Um, so I do appreciate you joining in today. Um, so I'm going to talk about the management of memorials in cemeteries. And the reason I asked about the registration scheme is because I was quite interested to see um, how, um, how the registration schemes that are available have been taken up or not by um, sort of parish and town council. So interesting results there. So um, hopefully at the end, we'll have time to talk about that a, a bit more. But I want to start, re start really by um, looking at the, the scope of the problem. Um, so when we're talking about memorials, I'm talking mostly about headstones and monuments in cemeteries, not really talking about gardens of remembrance today with plaques and, and memorials that are not going to cause a, a problem if they, um, you know, if they fall off the wall or something, they're not going to kill someone. Um, but the problem in cemeteries is that over the years, there has been a number of deaths and serious accidents involving falling memorials. Um, I don't know if anyone can remember, but back in 2000, a six-year-old boy was very sadly killed in a cemetery in Harrogate when a, a headstone fell on him. And it was really traumatic, obviously, for the whole family, but particularly his mum, who was, was there with him at the time, and the headstone fell on him and crushed him. Uh, and it was awful. And it obviously made the headlines and the health and safety executive went to investigate and they shut the cemetery down and they gave Harrogate um, Council two weeks to inspect their entire um, fleet of memorials, which was over 16,000 memorials. So during that time, there could be no burials. Nobody was allowed in the cemetery because they couldn't guarantee safety. So it was really, really quite serious. Um, Harrogate did, they put the resources in, they inspected 16,000 memorials, and they found that 6,000 of those 16,000 were unsafe. So really quite a large number. Um, and they had to, to lay them flat to make them safe. That really led to something of a, a panic, I guess, in the, uh, in the sector, because a lot of local authorities then went into kind of overdrive and said, right, if it's happened in Harrogate, it can happen to us. And so we better inspect our memorials. And many did, and many just went in and pretty much wholesale laid everything down. Um, and that led to a huge kind of outcry in the press um, because people would go into the cemetery. They think that vandals have been in because all the memorials have been pushed over. Um, and it caused an awful lot of problems. That then led to the local government ombudsman getting involved um, because they received so many complaints from members of the public about local authorities being heavy handed and going in and just clearing all these monuments. And so in 2006, the um, local government ombudsman published a spe special report that basically laid out some guidance for what local authorities should do uh, when it comes to memorial inspection. Um, and that was actually pretty sensible stuff. Um, and, and much of what they've put in their report still stands. And it's also been taken into account in our own guidance that we publish on the management of memorials. 
That was followed up in 2009 by the Ministry of Justice also getting involved and they published their guidance on the safe management of burial grounds. And in that guidance, they, they um, state that local authorities or burial authorities must take a sensible, proportionate and sensitive approach to dealing with the risk. So they did acknowledge that there is a risk in cemeteries, um, that the, the, the potential for harm is quite severe, but actually in the scale of things, if you think about how many cemeteries there are in the UK, which we don't actually know, just as a side note, nobody knows how many cemeteries there are because they're not centrally registered anywhere and they're provided by so many different agencies. So it might be a, a, front, uh, a, a small parish council, it might be town council, it might be a local authority, it might be a unitary authority, it might be a church, it might be a private company, it might be a friends group, there's all sorts of different provision. So we don't actually know how many cemeteries there are or indeed how many memorials there are, but we're talking millions. If you think Harrogate, the one cemetery in Harrogate that had 16,000 memorials, if we sort of extrapolate from that, you know, we're talking millions of memorials and of those millions of memorials, some of them will be unsafe. But the number of people injured and killed compared to the millions of memorials is relatively low. So the MOJ were talking about you know, yes, it's awful. Yes, there are risks. And yes, we must mitigate those risks. But let's not go overboard. Let's not just lay all, this, all the memorials down. You know, the, the, the risk is there, but it has to be managed in a sensible, proportionate and sensitive way. So their guidance um, also has been used to, to inform our own guidance um, and is still pretty much valid. You can get copies of the MOJ guidance and the Ombudsman report. Um, I can share links to those after the, um, the seminar, John, if, if that's appropriate. Oh, yes, definitely. We'll, we'll share them. Yep. Or Please. if Jess can find them on okay. the now. <laughs> Super. Um, also, what happened in, <clears throat> in 2005 was for the first time, there was a British standard for the fixing of cemetery memorials, which is fantastic because up to that point, there'd been no standard. And it was left to the memorial mason industry to decide how they were going to fix memorials. But in 2005, we had the introduction of British Standard 8415. That's the important thing you need to know. British Standard or BS 8415. And all memorials fixed in cemeteries now must conform to that British Standard. So we've got something now that we can use to say to masons, right, you can't fix in our cemeteries unless you fix to this standard. So that was a really good thing. Prior to that, I think um, you'll probably find that if you if you go to a cemetery that was opened in the Victorian period, you'll see lots of memorials, some very big ones, big angels, big crosses, huge, great, elaborate tombs. They tend to be pretty well built, to be honest. The Victorians knew what they were doing. And although they're old and they're big, and therefore there's a risk from age and size, they are really well constructed. The most problems I've seen in cemeteries comes from the 1980s and 90s, um, simple lawn headstones. So we're talking maybe three or four feet high, uh, granite slab basically that sits on a, on a base. They're the ones that will cause the most damage and they're the ones that were really poorly fixed traditionally. Um, sometimes they'll have been doweled onto the base, but sometimes not. Sometimes all that's holding them up is a skim of cement. And over time, water gets into that joint and when it freezes, it forces the joint apart. And then there's nothing holding that headstone up. And that's when they can fall and they can do some serious damage. And I know because I've had a toe broken by one of these headstones, it looked perfectly safe. And I just uh, went past it brushed it very slightly and it fell and broke my toe. Luckily only my toe. But if that fell on a, on a child or, um, or an elderly person who was visiting a grave, you know, that's going to do some serious damage if not cause death. So they're the ones that I've, in my experience, are the ones that, that are the most dangerous. So basically because of the deaths, um, it, it meant that local authorities had to do something. 
So we've published guidance and we've regularly reviewed that, um, bearing in mind sort of changes in, in legislation and changes in best practice. So there is a need for some sort of action by burial authorities, but you've got to be careful how you go about um, undertaking memorial safety testing. It's kind of a, a damned if you do, damned if you don't, really. If you don't do anything and there's an accident, you will be criticised. If you do do testing and take action to make memorials safe, you may still be criticised. However, you can help to mitigate that criticism by having the right approach. So if we think about the legal position, um, all burial authorities um, that are run, that, that um, are sort of parish town councils or any local authority are subject to uh, the conditions of the local authorities cemeteries order 1977. If you're not aware of that, I recommend you, you find it on, uh, you can Google it um, and read it because that really is your manual um, for making sure that you're legally compliant when it comes to running cemeteries. So the local authorities cemeteries order 1977, known as LACO for short, because it's a bit of a mouthful otherwise. Now local, at LACO requires a burial authority to keep their cemeteries in good order and repair. It doesn't define what that is, um, but it just means that you can't walk away from the cemetery, you've got to keep it in good order and repair. And within that, there's, a, there's an implication that the memorials in your cemetery should also be in good, good order and repair. We've then got the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, which places a duty on all operators to ensure um, that their premises, that they must do everything reasonably pr practicable to ensure that visitors and those working on their sites are not exposed to risks to their health and safety. And that's on, that's on all um, people who, who manage sites, not just cemeteries, but it does place the responsibility on whoever is operating the cemetery to make sure that the sites are safe for anyone visiting or anyone working. So it might be that you know your grounds maintenance team, they're quite vulnerable if they're in the cemetery. Um, you know, if they're cutting the grass around a headstone and that headstone's loose, it could fall and injure them, as well as bereaved people visiting graves. Now the legal position regarding the memorial is that. The, the safety of that memorial lies mainly with the owner of the memorial. So it really is up to the owner to make sure the, the memorial is safe. But of course, over time, owners disappear. They, they might die themselves and be buried in the grave. There might be no other family members to take over the uh, ownership of the grave. Um, so although the law says that it's the owner that is responsible, the burial authority also has a duty of care because of the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. So you can't just say, not my responsibility, it's down to the individual owners. You or the council, as the operator of the cemetery, has that duty of care. So as a burial authority, you can take action to remove a risk. So if you find a memorial is unsafe, you can take action um, to, to remove that risk but you're not compelled to actually refix that memorial or pay for that memorial to be refixed. You have to make sure it's safe and it's not gonna cause a problem, but you don't have to actually pay for it to be refixed. That is down to the owner. Of course, if there is no owner or you can't trace them, um, you can have it refixed, but you're not compelled to do so as long as you remove the risk. So where do we where do we start with all this? It's such a you know a big subject. Well, probably the um, the best thing to start with really is to develop a policy. And I know that sounds a bit arduous, and you think, oh blimey, I've got enough to do without that. But there's no need to reinvent the wheel. There are policies out there. If you uh, use our friend Google, uh, you can find pretty much anything these days. And there will be some of the burial authorities that have already published their memorial management policy on their website. And I'm not saying copy it exactly, but use it as a basis for your own. Um, have a look what they're doing, see how that fits in with, with what you're doing in your authorities and adapt it, adapt it to your own need. Make sure that your policy covers historic memorials. So 
memorials that have already been fixed, memorials already in your cemetery, and think about a testing regime to ensure that they are safe and what you're going to do if you find that they're not safe. So we've got the historic problem. And then also your policy can cover future memorials. How are you going to ensure that going forward, memorials in the future that are fixed now are not going to cause a problem? They need to be fixed safely. So your policy should say that any memorials fixed from now on must comply to British Standard 8415. That will make sure that clerks in the future are not faced with the same problems that you are when it comes to memorial safety. And your policy can um, include whether you're going to have a registration scheme for memorial masons or not. The, uh, the vote that we've, uh, we've just had was quite interesting. I think um, if I remember about 30% don't have a registration scheme or 47% don't have any form of registration scheme at the moment. I think it's important to have something in place to make sure that memorial masons who are fixing in your sites are properly trained, properly qualified and have the adequate public liability insurance. There are a couple of schemes out there. There's one called BRAM, um, which you might have heard of, which is the British Register of Accredited Memorial Masons. And there's one called RQMF, the Register of Qualified Memorial Fixers which is run by the National Association of Memorial Masons. The schemes are quite similar. The only difference really is that BRAM um, is made up of a board, um, which is half Memorial Masons and half burial authorities. So there's equity of opinion um, and it's very cooperative. What we've been involved with BRAM for a very long time and we were we were concerned that we didn't want the Masons dictating to burial authorities what they're going to do. And we didn't want burial authorities just saying, you've got to do this. We believe in talking to each other and coming up with solutions to common issues. And the main aim is to make sure that memorials are safe. That's, you know, that's what we all want. So there's two national schemes, BRAM and the RQMF. Some local authorities have got their own scheme, um, which is fine. And um, you can adopt one scheme, two schemes, three schemes, as many schemes as you like, or no schemes. You're not under an obligation, but if there was an accident involving a recently fixed memorial and the health and safety executive inspected, they would ask you, how do you know that Mason was properly qualified? And if you can't answer that question, then it's worth thinking about joining at least one of the schemes or having your own scheme in place. So I talked there about your policy and in your policy, you should have a, a testing regime. Um, the sector guidance out there, we've got the Ministry of Justice guidance, the local government ombudsman and the ICCM guidance. And all, the guidance all says that memorials should be tested on a regular basis. And the recommendation is that they're tested at least once every five years. It may be more frequent if there's um, a memorial that's particularly not it's not really unsafe but you're not quite sure that it's going to be safe in five years time so you want to keep a, a wary eye on it so you might say that that needs to be re-inspected in 12 months but generally every memorial should be tested at least once every five years and really the reason you're testing memorials is to see if they're unsafe so what is an unsafe memorial um it sounds quite obvious, doesn't it? But actually there is a definition. And the definition is that it's a memorial that moves when pushed by hand and would continue to move and fall if that pressure continued to be exerted. And the pressure that should be exerted is 25 kilograms. Hard to tell you what that is in real terms. It's not actually a great deal. Most of you would be absolutely capable of pushing 25 kilograms. So if the memorial moves and would continue to move and fall, then we class that as unsafe. If it moves, but actually locks into place um, and wouldn't fall, you know, if you couldn't push it over, then it's not unsafe. It needs keeping an eye on, but it's not unsafe. So if it moves but would fall, it's unsafe. So 
your testing regime needs to think about what your site is com composed of and where you're going to start. Have you got um, a, a sort of Victorian section where you've got lots of large memorials? Or is it a more recent cemetery where you've got lots of 80s and 90s lawn type memorials? Which ones are most likely to cause harm? Um, have you got sections where the ground conditions are particularly poor? They might be very wet, which can undermine the uh, foundations of memorials and cause problems. Are they on a slope? Which sections are most visited? Um, what you tend to find is that if you've got um, um, a sort of shortcut through your cemetery, so you might get lots of people taking their kids to school, for example, the paths that they walk along, you need to make sure the memorials along those are safe because kids being kids, you know, they're likely to kind of hop off the path and go and try and climb on the memorial or you know, run around it. So where most people are is where the most risk is. So before you kind of start your, your testing regime, you need to think about where you're going to start, what are you going to prioritise? You need to basically risk assess the entire site to look at where you're going to focus your resources in the, in the first instance. So you need to focus on where you think the most risk is. And as I say, that might be where people are visiting the most. It might be the oldest section of the cemetery, depending on, on the makeup um, of your site. So the purpose of that really is to, is to identify any hazards that have the potential to cause harm. So the Health and Safety Executive published lots of guidance on risk assessments, and I'm sure you've all done training on risk assessments, so I'm not going to go into great detail. But with a risk assessment, you have to identify a hazard or the hazard. Um, so what a hazard is what could cause an injury. And in this um, circumstance, it's a, a falling memorial. And the risk is how likely that is to happen and how seriously somebody could be harmed. So with a falling memorial, the hazard is that it can fall and um, land on somebody and break a bone or perhaps do even more damage. How likely is it? If all your memorials have been tested regularly, it's unlikely. If you've never tested your memorials, chances are that you've got some that are unsafe. So it could be likely that there'll be some, uh, some um, issues that you need to take action over. So once you've identified um, a hazard, you do need to control the risk. So that's the purpose of your, your policy, is to have that in place so that you've got your testing regime and what you're going to do if you find that memorials are unsafe. As part of your, your testing regime, you need to think about who's actually going to undertake this work. Is it going to be you or your staff, or are you going to use contractors? Um, if you're doing it yourself or your own staff or, or teams are, are going to do the safety checks, they do need to be trained. It's advisable that they go on some sort of training so that they've got an understanding of what they're doing and why. Um, it's not a sales pitch, but the ICCM does provide uh, a training course, but there are other providers as well. But training is important. Again, if there was an accident and the health and safety executive were to investigate, they would want to see training records to make sure that people doing the testing um, are adequately trained. If you're using contractors, that's fine. There's lots of organisations and companies that, that do um, uh, memorial safety testing, including the ICCM, but you'd want to make sure that they're a proper company, that they've got adequate insurance, and that they can provide references of, of places where they've um, previously worked. Just as an aside, anyone who's digging, uh, digging graves in your cemetery should also know how to test the memorial for safety, because when they're digging the grave, they need to check the surrounding area and the graves around to make sure that they're safe. Um, because at the day of the funeral, you might find that people when they're sort of standing around the grave, they might lean on a, a neighbouring headstone. And if that memorial isn't safe, they could lean on it and it could fall, they could fall with it, or it could fall on somebody else. So ideally, any grave diggers working in your site should also be able to test um, memorials for safety. So when you're doing your testing, whoever's doing it, it really should be recorded. So 
there's different ways of doing that. You can use a, a paper form um, that uh, you can record your results on, or there are now um, different bits of software. So several companies are offering memorial stability testing software that links with um, administration software. I don't know, John, if you've got anything like that yet on your existing development. Yeah, we have, uh, I mean, I'll show a little video later, but yeah, we have the ability to inspect and record the results of those inspections. Cool. Okay. It, it can save a lot of copying and, <laughs> and enter data entry, um, but forms are quite useful as well because they're not reliant on batteries or Wi-Fi signals or 4G or anything like that. So there's, there's pros and cons to both. Um, but if you've, if, if you've got sort of handheld devices, um, they can be quite good because then you just sort of plug them in when you get back to the office and it downloads to your existing software. So decide on your testing protocol, use it consistently and make sure that anyone doing the testing is doing the same thing. What you don't want is somebody going in and pushing headstones at 75 kilograms and somebody else doing it at 10. You need to have that consistent um, ability to push to 25 kilograms, which is where the training comes in. So when you're doing testing, we always recommend that you start with a visual inspection of the memorial, have a look at it. Is there anything really obviously wrong with it? Is it leaning? Are there cracks in the memorial? Um, have the joints broken apart? Has it been vandalized in any way? Is it covered in vegetation? Have a look visually, inspect the memorial, walk around it and have a look at it and see if there's any obvious problems and record those problems. So if it is leaning, make a note that it's leaning. You can also take photographs. And again, some of the handheld devices allow you to do that. Um, that can be quite useful because you can monitor then the next time you test, you can say, well, when I tested five years ago, it was perfectly upright, but actually it's now leaning at, at 75 degrees. So you've got a visual record of what's happening to that memorial. So visual inspection first, and then a simple hand test. Nothing fancy, we don't shake the memorial or anything like that. You basically stand in front of the memorial, making sure that there's nobody else standing around. What you don't want to do is do a hand test and it fall and hit your colleague behind you. That's not good. So make sure the area is safe, stand in front of the headstone, and at the apex of the site, do a gentle pressure, just a gentle pressure to see if that moves. Um, in the in the olden days, I'm going to say that now because it was 20 years ago when the when the Harrogate case happened and everybody went a bit crazy. Um, people were using devices called the topple tester. Some of you may have come across those. That was um, that was a brand rather than the actual name of the device, a bit like a Hoover is a vacuum cleaner. So topple tester was a type of force force measuring device, and what that did was um, it meant that you could only only apply a certain pressure. So you couldn't actually go over the recommendation of 25 kilograms. It wouldn't allow you to push any harder than that. And you pushed that um, force measuring device onto the memorial. And if it stayed upright at 25 kilograms, you get a beat to say that it was all fine. And that was OK, but um, a lot of people used them without really knowing what they were doing and actually were kind of pushing memorials over using the uh, the machines. They got a bit overzealous. And the Ministry of Justice were very critical of this and said that um, they shouldn't be used routinely. You can use them if you've got a memorial that you're not quite sure. It, it might be moving, but you're not quite sure what the force is. You can um, use a force measuring device, but we don't recommend that you use them routinely. A simple hand test will identify most unsafe memorials. Um, it's quite scary sometimes when you're doing testing, just how easy it is to move what looks like a solid headstone. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't take a lot of force. They will move quite easily. So a hand test will pick up an unsafe memorial most and most occasions. So we recommend slightly different approaches depending on the height of the memorial. So if it's under 500 millimetres, so under half a metre, the, the, the risk from that is relatively low. 
because that's not going to fall and kill somebody. It might cause some bruising and we don't want that to happen, but it's not quite as serious as a larger memorial. So under 500 millimetres, we'd recommend a visual inspection and a hand test. And if there's anything that's not safe, so if it's, uh, if it's like a tiny curb set that's fallen apart, then make it safe, maybe tidy it on the grave, make it, make it look nicer um, and let the owner know that there's been a, a problem. But it's not, you don't have to cordon it off or lay it flat or anything like that because it's not going to cause a massive amount of, of problems. Over half a metre and up to two and a half metres, we recommend a visual inspection followed by a hand test and then take any appropriate action to make it safe if it's found to be unsafe. So that's most of the memorials that you're going to be looking at between half a metre and two and a half metres. Over two and a half metres, you can't do a hand test, mainly because you can't reach, but also there's, there's different forces come into play with the bigger memorials and that's really beyond our expertise. So with memorials over two and a half metres, we recommend a visual inspection. Have a look, see if there's anything that gives you cause for concern. And if necessary, bring in a structural engineer to do a thorough test. If you've got, sometimes you've got um, kind of big uh, monuments and they've got a, an urn on top, or something like that and the urn's leaning at an angle you might want to cordon off the area until you get somebody in to look at that for you because if that urn fell that could cause some damage so anything over two and a half meters visually inspect and call in a structural engineer if you've got cause for concern so as a result of your test you're going to have um, some different priorities you can have as many categories as you want but we recommend keeping it fairly simple. So we have a category one, which is, is urgent, that is a, a memorial that is unsafe, so one that would fall if pressure was applied to it. So priority one, urgent, needs to be dealt with straight away. Priority two is not urgent. There is a bit of movement, but it's not going to fall, but we need to keep an eye on it. So we would say category two is reinspecting 12 months. And then category three, is where there's no problem with the memorial. Um, so just put that down for reinspection in five years. So you can have different subcategories if you want, but you, you want to keep it fairly simple for administration purposes. So one urgent, two reinspecting 12 months, three reinspecting five years. So if you've done your inspection and you found something's not safe, you need to mitigate those risks. Um, it's important to try and contact the grave owner wherever possible and give them the option to have the memorial refixed to the current British Standard 8415. You can use a stake and banding method where you put a, a stake behind the memorial and some sort of band around it to hold it onto the stake as a temporary measure while you're trying to contact the owner. That's okay, but you need to inspect that fairly regularly and it shouldn't be there for longer than 12 months. Um, ideally, within that time, you'll have found the owner and the owner can then arrange for it to be refixed. But to stop it falling over, staking and banding is, is, is a useful process. Also to put a notice on the grave so that people know that there's a problem with it. So you can put your contact details on there so people can contact you for further advice. It might be that you don't actually want to stake the memorial um, but you can cordon it off instead and again have a notice on there to explain what's happened um, and giving your contact details. I would only recommend laying the memorial flat if there's no other option. So if it's so unsafe that you know it, it really you can't leave it, it really is really, really risky, um, then you can lay it flat, but that would be kind of last resort. And as I say, that was the thing that the local government ombudsman um, were most critical of was the mass laying flat of row upon row of, of lawn headstones. So try not to, to lay them flat unless you've got no other option. And be sensitive in the way that you're dealing with the memorials. So if you're putting notices on, try not to cover names. And if you do have to lay a 
memorial flat, then lay it face up so that the inscription can still be read and lay it tidily on the grave so that it doesn't, it looks like a controlled laying flat rather than vandals going in. Before you start any memorial testing, you must raise awareness locally, okay? The biggest criticism that the local government ombudsman um, came up with was that people were not told what was happening. So they would, you know, visit the cemetery one week, go back the next week and see utter devastation. Um, and this is very upsetting for people. For bereaved people, a headstone isn't just a lump of stone and it's not just a health and safety problem to them. They invest a lot of emotional energy into a memorial. It means so much to them. Um, and even if it's unsafe, you know, by taking action without telling them you're doing that, that's a real insult. So we need to raise awareness, put notices in the cemetery on your website, have um, consultation days, invite people in, tell them what you're going to be doing. The more publicity you can give, the better, because that will help to mitigate any criticism if you do find memorials are unsafe and you have to take action. And if any parts of your site are consecrated, you will need to talk to your local diocese to see if you have to apply for a faculty. Some will insist that you do, some are okay if all you're doing is, is um, safety checking and making safe. Um, it just depends on, on the local diocese, but don't start without talking to them if you've got consecrated sections in your cemetery. So just to recap, it's important to formulate an agreed memorial management policy that ensures the regular inspection of memorials at all your cemeteries and make safe any that are found to be unstable or dangerous. Ensure that the works are carried out in a sympathetic way and the feelings of bereaved people are taken into consideration and maintain accurate records and correspondence with grave owners. Update the policy and testing regime periodically to ensure it complies with all uh, relevant legislation and local um, and latest policies. Don't do nothing, okay? If you haven't already started on a road to memorial safety, then, then do so. It's not that difficult. Um, there's lots of guidance out there. We can help, the ICCC, ICCM can help if need be. But if you don't do anything and there's an accident in your cemetery, you will be criticised. Um, so nobody wants that to happen. So make a start. Um, if you need help, we're here to provide that for you. So I think that's about it, John. Um, hope that was okay. I'm happy that's, to answer that's questions. Very, so. very good, Julie. I mean, initially I, I started out getting really stressed <laughs> about the the site, you know, the situation and the you know the size of the problem for people. But the way you've talked us through it, you know, how to communicate how yeah. to plan the methodologies, the testing, and particularly probably the prioritization part of it is, you know, you might have an estate of a loads of cemeteries, but actually a big majority of those, you know, aren't really in the, the danger zone. Um, so you can break it up. So that's good. So we are yeah. getting a bunch of questions coming through. Before we go to that, I'm just going to play a brief uh, four, four and a half minute video just to give you an overview of Scribe uh, Cemetery by my colleague Nathan, which does cover um, some of the stuff related to, to inspections. So I'll just fire that off now. And yeah, the people that have been asking the questions, I'm going to ask you to ask them uh, via Zoom if you don't mind. So just get ready if you can put your camera on um, ready to ask questions when I call you out and also unmute yourself when, when you're ready. So we'll we'll get back to that in a second. Hi, my name is Nathan and I'm one of the Scribe experts here at Scribe. Quite frequently I do demonstrations with prospective customers of ours who are looking at our cemetery package. So I know some of the main things that tend to be popular with the people I speak with. I wanted to share with you today some of my five favorite features of our cemetery package that may bring benefit to you and your council as you're watching this, but we're always more than happy to do a personalized demonstration on a one-to-one -one basis off the back of this as well. So let me jump right into it and show you some of my favorite features. So firstly, with regards to the records that you can keep on Scribe Cemetery. Now they can be imported from an existing spreadsheet, just so you are aware, but 
The main thing for me is the advanced search that allows you to look for your records with anything similar to an ancestry record request to be able to find what you're looking for nice and easily. So for example, with regards to if we're searching by age, we might not know the, the exact age and that's absolutely fine. We can search by an age that's greater than, as an example, 78. Similarly, we can then apply that filter and then add further filters if needed from there. So if I wanted to add in details of the surname, but I only knew that the surname started with the letter W, we can also search by that further, limiting down our results and trying to find exactly what we're looking for. Following on from the advanced search, the next thing I was going to show would be your customizable notices. Going back to my main entries for our records here, you can see I've got this exclusive right of burial that's already in our record list. Now, at any time, you can go to the more options and generate a notice that applies to this. So for our assignment of exclusive right, I can click view notice and that will provide us with that notice ready to go. However, for the template of this document, if it needs to be customized to use a wording that is traditionally used by you at your council, you have the option on the left to jump into notices and actually find that template document where you can then jump into the details of the one you're trying to raise and change any of the wording that's actually contained within. Further to that, we then have the mapping system available in our cemetery package as well. Now this locks onto an image of your cemetery from Google Maps, and this will allow you to plot out the different cemetery areas, which you can see in the background defined in red. The different plots that we have lined up here are represented in blue for our burials. The greens are our empty plots. Our reds are our exclusive rights of burials and yellows memorials. And all of these entries that are on the map, you can click into edit to jump to the record that that map relates to. From there, we can also export this map as a print, printable image or save it as an image onto our computer as well. Further to that, jumping back once back more to our records, if you were doing any inspections on any of the plots in your cemetery, you can come to more and go to inspections on the right hand side to load the details of any historical inspections that you've got saved on the system. You can then add a new one with the button at the top right, which will allow you to save details in regards to the condition of the grave, any removal or memorial details, memorial safety inspection, and then any required actions. They can then all be summarized in the reports that are available in Scribe Cemetery, where you can generate your condition report to get the summary of all of those inspections. Those inspections can be done on a mobile device as Scribe Cemetery will reformat to a mobile format if using it through your mobile browser. And lastly, but not least, would be the integration that Scribe has with accounts for any of your records that you need to generate an invoice for, you can hit send to accounts at the top right of the screen, then selecting as many of your records as you need to raise invoices for, and then hit create invoices. After they've been sent across, you'll see this icon on the right hand side, which indicates there's a linked invoice over in accounts. If you click onto that, that will take you to that invoice as well. So I hope you've enjoyed seeing some of the main features that I like to show our customers when looking at Scribe. To see more in regards to the accounts integration and then how you can manage that on the account side of Scribe, feel free to check out our other video where we run through the same five points in regards to Scribe accounts. And if you would like a personalized demonstration on a one-to-one -one basis, please feel free to reach out. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Goodbye. John, you're muted. Yes, thank you, Nathan. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so Thank you, Jess. Um, yeah, so we've got some questions. So I'm going to start with Barbara Bodkin. Are you there, Barbara? Do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Or... Yeah, hi. I think my question's already been answered, actually. I, I just Perfect. asked. Yeah, so I'm, I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> no problems. Elizabeth Raymond? <clears throat> yes, that's myself. Just say thank you. An excellent presentation. I learned a lot there. Um, apologies if my question is naive. I'm a new clerk and a new to burial clerk as well. I took a walk around our very small cemetery. It's a very small parish council. And uh, I must admit, I did nearly have an accident because the, the one of the headstones nearly fell flat on me, which surprised me. Um, but it's, it's a question of raising money. If we can't find a family, are most parish councils raising their money through their precepts? Is that how we get the money to manage a memorial? 
that's that's a good question. Thanks for that, Elizabeth. Um, I think it, it varies between different authorities. Um, I, it's a difficult one because you have the responsibility to make it safe, but you're not obliged to spend public money on private property. So it's kind of it, how far do you go? At, at the same time, you've got to keep your cemetery in good order and repair. So you could argue that by using money from the precepts that you are using that to help keep the cemetery in good order and repair, even though it's private property that you're spending it on. So it's kind of it's never been tested in court as far as I'm aware. So um, I think the main thing is the, the first thing to do really is to try and get the family involved, to try and get the grave owner or anybody um, who might be, you know, if the grave owner is deceased, there may still be family in the area. Because really, it is their responsibility to have it fixed to British standard. If that's not possible, if uh, if people don't do that, then you've got some options. Now you could um, actually take the memorial away. Uh, local authority cemeteries order does allow you to do that under certain conditions. You have to give certain notices, but you could do that. But do you really want to? And also, that costs money now as well, um, because what you're going to do with that memorial? So the, the best thing would be to preserve it in situ on the grave wherever possible. Now, if it's a lawn headstone, one option might be um, to, to create what we call a monolith, where you bury the memorial a third in the ground. So it's not actually going to fall over. So you're preserving the memorial in situ. Most times you can still see the inscription and the memorial is there should anybody come forward and want to refix it properly. So that might be an option. Um, or as I say, I, I, it might be interesting if anybody um, has actually sort of addressed this, where does the money come from? Um, as I say, I know it, it varies sort of around the country, but um, there are some options for if, if family don't spend their own money, then there are some options for the council as to what you're going to do to make sure that that memorial is safe. Thank you. And, and would you recommend approaching our local stonemasons in the first instance to get a, a feel for how much it's going to cost to get these things leveled yeah and I, think, I think absolutely i mean usually you know it's it's good to get them on board um partly because they'll get some work out of it but also sometimes i've known memorial masons say that they'll fix any that they've fixed in the past for free um because they don't want the bad reputation of you know sort of locally being thought of as well that's all their memorial space so then they will probably want to work with you um and maybe sort of offer a special rate um to refix any that do fail just as a, a point since 2005 when the british standard came in we shouldn't really have any unsafe memorials fixed after 2005. if you find they are then it's probably worth going to the memorial mason anyway and seeing if they will refix it free of charge because they should have fixed it to British Standard 8415. And if they haven't, there's an argument that actually they should be putting it right free of charge anyway. And certainly any memorial that was fixed um, up to six years ago, if there's any problems with that, under the Sale of Goods Act, the Mason would be obliged to, to rectify it for free. Now, hopefully you're not going to find any from six years ago that were unsafe, but you never know. Um, but just, you know, it, it, it can be quite useful to know that if there is a problem with a more recent memorial. Thank you so much. That's cool. perfect. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, over to Michelle Harrington. Are you there, Michelle? Yes. Hi, thank you. I've got two questions, if I may, please. Um, sure. We do state in our rules that the stonemason must have a fixer's licence issued okay. by either Bram or the RQMF. Yeah. Um, we don't mention NAM, should okay. we? <laughs> no, because RQMF is run by NAM. Okay, perfect. So Thank um, that, that's their scheme. So the RQMF is, is the important part of that. So um, so you don't need to particularly specify NAM because it's, it's implied. Thank you. Um, and the other question is a scribe question. Um, I know we can put in the, the family details so it can log their address, their contact details, etc., for future use. Is there a section with 
in that record, though, that we can then say that which stonemason they used or which funeral directors they used, so that should the grave need topping up or should something happen with the memorial, we know which funeral director or which stonemason they used. Uh, Jessica, do you want to answer that one? Or I yeah, can... I'll I'll have to double check that, but I'll get in touch with you after the session, Michelle, and we can maybe arrange a call and, and go through that. Yeah, because I, I mean, I imagine you can also just put it in as a note and then you can also have that that supplier in your CRM. You add it as a contact um, in there. Um, but yeah, I think attaching to a particular record, you can't attach a supplier to it at the moment. But it's something we could actually consider. But you can definitely throw it into the notes. Cool. Thank you, Michelle uh, Lois Dale. Dale, what a lovely lay, uh, name. Um, you've got a couple of questions. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad you pronounced it properly because that's my main problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I just felt a bit confused. I think mainly by your terminology, you said we need to have a registration scheme. By that, do you mean we need to actually ask them to work to the gram or the uh, RQMF? Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, a, a registration scheme is um, where you only allow. Uh, suitably qualified memorial masons to fix in in your cemeteries. Yes, yeah, so, so I think um, me getting it wrong. I thought you meant we have to develop a scheme of some sort. But... No, oh, uh, no, so, I, <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. Um, yeah, so Bram is a registration scheme. The RQMF is a registration scheme, or you can do your own registration scheme where you can set your own criteria for which masons you will allow to fix in your cemeteries. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I don't know if everybody does, but we, we recommend um, some sort of permitting system. So when somebody wants a memorial, the mo memorial mason submits an application form to the burial authority, who then checks that it's the owner who's applying um, and that it, the memorial fits with your regulations and your sizes and everything. And if, uh, if it's OK, you issue a permit to that mason. So it's a way of controlling um, memorial installations yeah. in your cemetery. But yeah, the yes. registration scheme is the BRAM or the RQMF yeah. or your yeah, own. We, we do run that sort of permit scheme. Um, I think most of the Masons I've ever seen, yeah, they've all we put like their registration and their numbers and, and stuff yeah. on, the, yeah. on their paperwork. Um, yeah. Yeah, the other question I had was about testing. Mm. They have, should it really be done by a member of staff? obviously after training, or can we get volunteers or councillors to do it? You, you can use um, volunteers or councillors. I've worked in some authorities where, where the councillors have been trained uh, and have carried out the testing. The important thing is that they're, they're trained um, and um, ideally kind of supervised uh, <laughs> and that um, they know how to record their findings. Um, and I think, you know, training needs to be sort of current as well. So if they were trained 20 years ago, that probably wouldn't suffice. They need to have some, something a bit more up to date than that. Um, the other thing you would need to check, though, is with your insurance company to make sure that um, they would be covered um, if there was any problem. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, I th actually, I mean, I was talking to Chris um, earlier this week in terms of using volunteers it also goes back to Michelle's point about funding I think you know the more and more you could perhaps use volunteers or from the community the better for uh you know obviously if they're trained and supervised but yeah not only for the inspections but the initial because it's overwhelming when we have customers joining us you know all their records are paper-based and to transcribe them into digital and capture all those records you know again finding some enthusiasts in the community that like this kind of historic records and you know going through it and you know the same could be for inspections so anyway um if you have any further questions feel free to drop them in the chat or email us afterwards we will be sending through a recording of this um before we go to that i'm i'm just gonna you know uh yeah share the iccm website so you can go along um, and have a look at it. So I guess, um, Julie, you, I mean, in order to benefit from the training, I mean, can you get one-off training or do you have to sign up for a membership? As, no, as I look. no um, we, we do offer training courses. There's a <coughs> different fee for members and non-members, but we 
we don't turn anyone away we welcome everyone um so there is yeah. it's it's not an awfully good website i will admit and it can be quite hard to find anything um, so where should we go so we look into training and yeah. this training here to other training yeah. oh yeah click other training and then okay. um management of memorials so these are all online good yeah they're all online mm. ones and then we do a couple of in-person ones um Oh, you got a bunch. Yeah, you're quite. Yeah, you got a lot listed there. And then, and then, if you want it cheaper, then you can sign up as a member. What do town and parish co councils normally membership? Do they normally get? Um, they go for corporate membership, yep. which is ninety five pound for a year. Oh, that's not too bad. Which okay, is, it's not bad at all. So um, that gets you discount on the training as well as. Yeah, yeah as well as access to to officers for um, technical advice um attendance at any events we do is at a, a member's price rather than a non-member's price um so yeah pretty pretty good value all yeah around. it seems very reasonable um because yeah it's quite a big topic and responsibility so julie thanks again uh for I, I just sorry john i just saw a question pop up on the oh yeah yeah good fire away yes karen think, uh, is, uh, karen says is there a cost to become bram registered no absolutely not bram is absolutely free um, no cost to uh, to burial authorities at all. That's great. great. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Yes. No. Yeah. Thank you, Julie, uh, for giving up your time. We'll be sharing. Um, we'll create a blog from it. Grab all those links that you shared, uh, you discussed, and then share it with all all of you uh, people that registered. Um, and again, yeah. If you yeah, we'll we'll include Julie's contact details if you ever want to reach out to her directly. And yeah, we'll also share the last year. You know, we've got a blog of the last event Julie did, top 10 compliance tips. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll be including that in the email. Otherwise, everyone have a really good day. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.